All right, let's go ahead and begin. This is problem session number two, EE313, Linear Signals and Systems. So we're going to start off today with uh, some examples with the Fourier series. Then we're going to move on to some examples related to eigenfunctions. And then finally, Laplace transforms. And if we have time, some linear constant coefficient, differential, and difference equations. So let's start off with uh, Fourier series examples. And so we're going to look at several different examples here that go uh, both into the frequency domain and from the frequency domain into the time domain. And then one thing I want to alert you all to is that I have up here photocopied the key tables and properties from the various asundry chapters that we're going to need here. So for your transform pairs, for your properties here, and then later we'll need the Laplace transforms and Laplace transform pairs and properties here. So I'm going to be referring to these sheets here, but this is just sheets that come from your textbook, and I would advise you to record all this information on your own personal sheets for the, the midterms, as I wouldn't provide that normally. Okay, so I got some questions about doing reconstruction with a Fourier series, and so I thought I would start with that, and then we'll move on to a couple other different examples here. So let's look at this first example where this is related to one that I don't think we covered in class. And suppose that you have a function x of t which is real and periodic with period t equals 8. And it has Fourier series coefficients A1 equals A minus 1 equals 2, and A3 equals A th minus 3 conjugate, which is equal to 4J. And so what we want to do is we want to write the time domain signal using the different forms of the Fourier series, the exponential, the Cartesian, and the polar form. So let's start with the exponential form. So find x of t in the exponential form. So the exponential form is the one that we've been using most in class. And just to start this off, let's note that omega naught, which is the fundamental frequency, is 2 pi over t equal to 2 pi over 8, so it's pi over 4. So pi over 4 is our fundamental frequency. And then in the exponential form, x of t is the sum from minus infinity to infinity, a of k, e to the j, omega naught, k, t. And in this case, that's going to be the sum from minus infinity to infinity, a of k, e to the j, substituting in pi over 4, pi k t over 4. So. These examples with synthesis of Fourier series coefficients, I mean, all we're doing is plugging into the synthesis equation and getting the time domain signal. I mean, that, that's actually it. So we have four coefficients that are not zero. So we're going to expand this out, right? This is a sum over an infinite number of coefficients. So let's plug this in here. So we're going to get a minus 3 conjugate e to the minus j pi over 4, 3t, and that's minus because of the minus there. And then we're going to get, sorry, this should be a3, sorry, this should just be a minus 3 here, no conjugate. And then plus a minus 1, e to the minus j, pi over 4 times 1t, plus a1, e to the j pi t over 4 plus a3 e to the j pi 3t over 4. And then I just, I'm going to substitute in and collect the terms together. So I'm going to get over, I'm going to put the a1s first. So I get 2 e to the j pi 
t over 4 plus 2 e to the minus j pi t over 4 plus 4j e to the j pi 3t over 4. And then note that this is a3 equals a minus 3 conjugate. So that means that a minus 3 is equal to minus 4j. So then that's going to be minus 4j e to the minus j pi 3t over 4. And so this is, um, we would stop here, you know, if you're just asked to provide the exponential form. Now, you can see here that the way I've collected the terms, of course, there's going to be a further uh, simplification. And you could either take that now or, you know, you could in principle stop here. But this is the exponential form. So now let's find x of t in the um, Cartesian form. Let me write this here. So this is exponential form. So let's write this as, so find x of t in Cartesian form. And we can do this because remember that the, um, the Cartesian and polar form were only for the case where x of t was real. And we were given that x of t is real in this problem. And so if x of t is real, then you have in the, the polar form here, or the Cartesian form, I didn't have the general, did I put the general equation? Well, anyways. So Cartesian form, so we can write, so we have x of t is equal to 2 e to the j pi t over 4 plus 2 e to the minus j pi t over 4 plus 4j <coughs> e to the j pi 3t over 4 minus 4j e to the minus j pi 3t over 4 here. And then if we collect these terms together, we get 2 times this, which looks like uh, the cosine, missing the 1 half. So this is equal to 4 cosine pi t over 4. And then this is 4j minus 4j this. So this looks kind of like a sine, except we're missing the 1 over 2j. So multiplying by 2j, we're going to get minus 8 here. So then this is going to be, so multiplying this yeah, by 2j, so this is then going to be minus 8 sine of, if you call this, 3 pi t over 4. Um, it should be... It should be minus because we had to multiply and divide by 2j, and so we get j squared, which is minus 1, so we get minus 8. Yeah, so I'm taking this whole thing here, and I'm going to make it look like a sine, but then I'm going to even it out there. Okay, and so then this is the, um, the Cartesian form is this right here. Right, and remember that, you know, the general form of the Cartesian form was something like, you know, A0 plus, well, it, we, we had different, we had different letters here. Let's call this A0 plus the sum from k equals 1 to infinity. This might be, I forget what we called this in the book now, BK cosine of omega naught kT plus CK sine of omega naught KT. This was done correctly here. So it should look something like this here. And then, and then now let's find X of T in the um, polar form. And so here, to put everything in the polar form, the general form was sums of cosines with phases. And so we want to get rid of the sine and replace it with a cosine. So how do we get rid of a sine and replace it with a cosine? Yeah, so we have a sine, so which way do we want to phase shift it to get a cosine?
could go either way, because one way it's going to be cosine, the other way it's going to be minus cosine. Mm, what happened here? Both as before. Yeah, I did. Okay. So it should be, yeah, plus pi over 2 here. And actually it should be, what I have it in my notes is it's going to be plus h cosine of 3 pi t over 4 plus pi over 2. So let's see if that makes sense here. So we've got like the sine would be, you know, generally it looks something like this here. And then we shift it by plus pi over 2. We're going to shift this over here. And then we get the sine change. It flips it over. So, yeah. So we get 8 cosine pi t over 4 plus pi over t. And then the general form for this here was something like x of t was equal to um, a0 plus sum from k equals 1 to infinity. And this was, I can't remember the notation we used, rk cosine omega naught k plus something like this, theta of k here. Okay, so this is the polar form. And for the most part in class, we've been using the, the exponential form here. So we would usually you know, stop here, although in this case, it's a little more elegant, I think, actually, to, to proceed and go there. Because you know it's real. So getting rid of the complex exponentials just feels good because then it makes it look like it's actually real now, right? There's no j in there. Uh, yeah, so that's the first you know, simple example I wanted to do here. Is there any questions on this, this example? And let me just look up something here. So I realize I'm missing a page from my notes on this problem. Um, Okay, yeah, so I'll just write the general formulas here on this third page just so it's clear. Um, so if this is the exponential form, we use x of t is sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity, a of k, e to j omega naught k t. And then if real, then this is the Cartesian form You can let, for every ak, let ak equal bk plus j times ck. So that's where the Cartesian comes in, because we're writing this complex Fourier series coefficient using its Cartesian form. And because it's real, and um, therefore we know that a of k is equal to, there's going to be conjugate symmetric, so it's going to be conjugate minus ak here. And then that lets us rewrite this in the general form I had earlier, which was, and I should put the little a0 here. That's the thing that I was missing here. But it's going to be, um, let me see, make sure I have it correct here. Yeah, a0 plus, plus 2 times the sum from k equals 1 to infinity a b k cosine of k omega naught t plus minus, ah, minus ck sine of k omega naught t. So yeah, I missed the, sorry, I had the wrong sign over here. And so this is the general form <coughs> here. So we could have just taken the fact that a1 is equal to, what was a1 in the problem? That was 2. And then a3 was equal to 4j. So then we could have said, OK, this is equal to b1 plus j c1. Therefore, b1 is equal to 2. c1 is equal to 0. And then this is equal to b3 plus j c3. Therefore, b3 is equal to 0. And c3 is equal to 4. And then we could have just plugged in directly and got 
x of t is equal to cosine of omega naught t minus 4 sine 3 omega naught t. So that's the Cartesian form, exponential form, and then just again the polar form. So if real, in the polar form, x of t. Sorry, the polar form, we write the Fourier series coefficients using the polar notation. So we write them as a k e to the j theta of k. And then x of t is equal to a0 plus 2, sum from k equals 1 to infinity, a k cosine omega naught k t plus theta of k. And then again in our case here, we can write a1 is equal to 2 times e to the j0. And we can write a3 is equal to, is equal to 4j. But what is j in polar form? You want to remember where j is on the unit circle? It's pi over 2. So, therefore, a1 is equal to 2, theta1 is equal to 0, and then a3 is equal to 4, theta3 is equal to pi over 2. And then if we did this correctly, we'll get the answer we had before, which, yeah, looks correct. So then we'll get x of t is equal to 2 cosine omega naught, I forgot the 2 over here, of t, and then we have the 4, so it's going to be then, oh yeah, right, mul sorry, multiplied by 2, so I was missing the 2 here, that's what, yeah, sorry, yeah, exactly, I thought it was something that's going here, all right, that's 4, that's 8, and then here we've got 4 plus 8, cosine omega naught 3t plus pi over 2. So that's how to go between the exponential Cartesian and polar forms. Okay, any questions on this? Okay, so let's go to the next example. And this is one that um, I think I skipped in class. This is an example of finding the Fourier series coefficients where we're going to use the properties of the Fourier series. So find Fourier series coefficients of x of t minus t0 plus x of t plus t0 where x of t is periodic with period t, has Fourier series coefficients a of k. Okay, we can call this, you know, just for completeness here, we call that y of t here. So this is like a generic problem because we don't know the specific function x. We're just given that it's periodic and it has a Fourier series, and it's periodic with period t. Now, we did several problems where we looked at the sums and products of periodic functions, and sometimes their periods change, but y of t is still periodic with period t. It might actually be a special function that it's also periodic with period t over 2 or period 2t, but, well, it's always periodic with period 2t, but its fundamental period what I'm saying is the fundamental period might not be t, but anyways it is periodic with t. So let's just show that here. So note y of t plus capital T is equal to x of t plus capital T minus t0 plus x of t plus capital T plus t0. But this right here, because this is periodic, this is just x of t minus t0. And this is, because this is periodic, this is x of t plus t0. So we know that it is periodic with period t, and so now we're going to compute the Fourier series coefficients, assuming that, you know, that period t is the fundamental period. And we're going to use the properties here, so now let's look at the, um, refresh our memory on the properties table. Here's the properties, and 
the ones that we need here, so here's like basically the time shift. So just like with Fourier series, if I shift in time, I get a product with an, a complex exponential in frequency. So shifting by T0 here gives us in frequency a multiplication by e to the minus j. You might not be able to see this. It's k omega naught T0. So this is really just like in the Fourier, just exactly the same factor there. So using the table, x of t minus t0 has Fourier series coefficients a k e to the minus j k omega naught t0, which is in this case just some number, t0. And then x of t plus t0 has Fourier series coefficients a k, and then this is the table we had, we had minus t0, and then we had minus j, k, omega naught, t naught. So because that minus is not here, this is now minus t0. So this is going to be then plus j, k, omega naught, t0. And so therefore, from linearity, Fourier series coefficients of y of t are the sum of the Fourier series coefficients of its components. So that's going to be a of k e to the minus j k omega naught t naught plus a of k e to the j k omega naught t naught. And then if you factor this, you get what looks like a cosine here. We're missing the one half, so this becomes 2 a k cosine k omega naught t zero. And then that would be your final answer. So any questions about this problem here? Now we It doesn't matter. If, if you're not given the specific value of the period, then it's perfectly fine to leave it as omega naught. And then, and sometimes when you plug in for omega naught, when, it, with, when you have an actual value, things will simplify further. But here, you know, just leave it. Any other questions about this problem? Is, are these Fourier series coefficients real or complex? If x of t is real, are the Fourier series coefficients real? No, it's only, let's look at this here. So let's refer back to the table here from section 3.56. If x is real, its Fourier series coefficients are conjugate symmetric, but it doesn't mean that they're real. The only time the Fourier series coefficients would be real would be if x was real and even, then that's real. And e then, then they, yeah, then they're actually real. So, so you have to have like more symmetry to get things to be completely real in both domains. And that's the like same thing that we did with the Fourier series. So generally, you know, Fourier series of a complex function is complex, and then if it's real, then it's conjugate symmetric, and then if it's even, then it's either real or symmetric, and then if it's odd, then it's imaginary. So why I was asking that was that you might think, ah, oh, there's a cosine here, so therefore this thing is real. But it's not necessarily because AK can be a complex number still. It's just a simplification. No, they're not. No, oh, let's yeah. go back again here. They're conjugate symmetric. And we, we can see that also from the form of like, you know, look at the Cartesian and polar forms. When you have this conjugate symmetry, you can rewrite the Fourier series as a function of cosine and sine, or as with cosine with a phase shift. And these are all real, right? The AK is real, the BK is real, the CK is real.
Okay, perfect. Now I have another example. Okay. So in this example, um, which I didn't I didn't plan it, but it's perfect here. So let um, x of t be real and periodic with period t and Fourier series coefficients a of k. And then find the Fourier series coefficients of the even part of x of t. Now there's two approaches here. You can either look directly in the table for the answer or you can rewrite this as a function of x of t and transformed x of t's and then look in the table and try to get the answer. Um, I'm advocating both approaches because if you don't remember all the entries in the table, you might, you might forget, hey, we had even in the table. So if you don't remember evens, this is even and real. So the even part of x of t, because it's real, is just going to be 1 half x of t plus x minus t. So this is the Fourier series coefficients of the even part. I should write this even here. Is one half is the Fourier series coefficients of one half of x of t plus one half of x of minus t. And so now we can use linearity. We know the Fourier series coefficients of x of t. So this is one half even of the Fourier series coefficients of even of x of t. That's going to be one half. A K. Now then we have to go back to table, the Fourier series coefficients of the transform signal. So we go back to the table here. This is X of minus T. So Fourier series coefficients are X of minus K. No conjugate, just minus K. And so then that becomes one half A minus K here. And then let me see what I'm missing here. So that's the basically the answer here. One half a of k plus a of minus k. And then alternatively, well, you could look in the. Actually, we don't we don't exactly have this in the table because well we have real and even right here. A k is real and even, but it doesn't tell us exactly how to get the resulting Fourier series coefficients. But let's check here. Are the Fourier series coefficients real and even? Yeah, so it's real. Okay, let's see. X is, okay, so X is real. Yeah, we have this, yeah, because then we're going to add this, we're going to add this plus this conjugate symmetric part. But then because it's real, we also have the fact that AK is equal to A minus K conjugate as well. So then could see that AK is equal to A minus K, so you're taking the taking this and adding it to its conjugate, so it's real. So anyways, yeah. So then we know that this is actually real and it's also even function. And it's even because we take in the A of K and added its time reversed piece, and so that gives us even. Okay, so that was just a simple example here with the table. Um, for the most part, I mean we did, I guess we didn't do any example with the integral, but uh, you know, the integral examples are similar. Yes? Right, that's a good question. That was, um, I think, my next, yes, that's my next question, actually. Okay, so let's go for that here. Yeah, I made a note myself of to, to do that problem as well. Um, okay, so now let's let x of t be periodic 
with period T. And then the problem is find the Fourier series coefficients of the even part of X of T. Now, if it's, if it's possibly complex, then we know that the even part of X of T is equal to one-half X of T plus one-half X conjugate of minus T. And so then um, we have to do, well, there's two things that we can do here. Let's see. So we know that, you know, X of T goes to A of K. That is a K. And then we know that X conjugate of T from the table goes to A conjugate of minus K. And then if we had X of minus T, that would go to A of minus K. So then putting these two together here, X conjugate of minus T should go to what? A conjugate of K, exactly. So then the Fourier series coefficient should be one half A of K plus one half A conjugate of K, which is one half A K plus A conjugate of K. And if you take a complex number and add its conjugate, what do you get? Twice the real. So this is equal to one half times twice the real part of A of K, and that's equal to the real part of A of K. So that's the, that's the final answer there. And it's perfectly acceptable to leave things in terms of these functions real. I mean, in this case, when you're, when you're dealing with even and odd, you will often get things as a result that will be real and imaginary. So this little operator is useful. And let's see, this is, um, yeah, in fact, we don't, have, we don't exactly have this in the table because all the stuff in the table is real and real and even. So this is something that we got that's slightly different than what we had. Okay, other questions on this here? All right, let's look at, okay, I did that. All right, let's look at one more example from, where we're going to use the table here. Let me see. Oh, yeah, okay. <coughs> Get it here. All right, actually, I could skip this example. Do you want to see one more example of the table or one more complicated example? Anybody? Table? Complicated. All right. For the sake of time, let's go to this new example that's a little bit more complicated here. This is one that we did in class, but I went through it quickly, and I'm going to go through it in a slightly different way here. And uh, the problem statement here is essentially find the signal that has Fourier series coefficients a k equals minus one to the k sine of pi k over eight over two pi k and then a zero is equal to one over sixteen so this is for k not equal to zero and we're told that t is equal to eight so this is a problem that uh, we talked about in class it is a reconstruction problem we're given the Fourier series coefficients and we want to figure out what signal generated these Fourier series coefficients. Now, you could just plug into the, the Fourier series um, synthesis formula, right? You can do that, but you've got essentially a sync function here, and it, it's a little bit hard to see, at least for me, that how that simplifies directly. So what we want to do is we want to use this following result, and this is, um, I'm going to re, I'm not going to rederive it here, but I'm going to draw out the, the result that we're using here. This is, a, this is a problem that actually comes from the book. We're going to use the results from example 3.5 in the book, which was where we had a, a periodic square wave of width T1 and with period of T and a height of 1. So this is X of T here and this is T. Then what's derived in, in the book in example 3.5 is that this function has Fourier series coefficients A of K is equal to sine of K 
omega naught T1 over K pi, for K not equal to zero. And then for K equals zero, the coefficients are two T1 over T, two T1 over T. And this is a good Fourier series to remember because this is basically a periodic function constructed from shifted rectangle functions, which we've played with a lot. And you can see that the Fourier series coefficients look uh, like essentially a sink. And we can just rewrite this in terms of the sink. But because the book uh, in this example was not using the sink function, I'm not writing it as a sink here just to avoid uh, confusion. But yeah, so this, this was a problem here. And so what, what this is telling us here is this gives us a new Fourier pair that was not in our table that has a lot of resemblance uh, to what we have over here. And so now the question is really like, so I've used AK here, but really this signal is probably some transformed version of this signal. And so the question is, how is it transformed? And that's like the objective of this problem is, is to reason out that transformation without doing the inverse Fourier series. <coughs> And so to do that, we're first going to look at um, <coughs> this first piece here. So let's consider, you know, this the signal here. So let's look at this right here, sine of pi k over 8 over 2 pi k. Let's, um, okay, so let's rewrite this here as, let's see. Let's consider this term here, sine of pi k over 8 divided by, I'm going to get rid of the 2, I'm just going to write pi k here. So we know from this example here that this function, sorry, that this, these Fourier series coefficients correspond to a time domain function that looks like what here? I mean. So suppose that this is a of k here for k not equal to zero. Let's call it um, let's call it b of k to avoid confusion here. And let's just I ignore b zero right now. So if if this is the coefficients of b k, then comparing with this formula here, we see we have pi k pi k. We have k omega naught t one, and here we have k over eight. So the question is, can we make in, in our case, does omega naught T1 equal pi over 8? Well, if we plug in, we get 2 pi over 8. And then T1 is something is equal to pi over 8. Let me just check to make sure I'm doing this correctly here. Yes, but T is eight. So we're told that we're told that the we're told that T is eight here. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm doing Yeah, we're doing this right here. Okay. So then can we find a T one that satisfies this? Yes. And that would be T one equals one half. So if T one is equal to one half, then that would correspond to a, a signal that looks you know, just sketching it out right here. So it would have would go from one half to minus one half, and then this would be four, and then I should draw this over here, and this would be over here. This is like this is going to be eight, so this is like seven and a half, and this is eight and a half here, etc. Okay, so we've got we've got a signal that takes care of kind of this piece here. So now let's consider. A signal that has Fourier series coefficients, let's call it CK is equal to minus 1 to the K BK. And note that in this case, C0 is still equal to B0, so we're not going to pay attention to B0 right now. We're just going to focus on the non-zero ones. 
So this is going to be minus 1 to the k times sine of pi k over 8 divided by pi k here. All right, so this minus 1, whenever you see this kind of minus 1 here, this is just a tricky way of writing the complex exponential. So what is minus 1 in terms of, you know, complex exponential? E to the, so this is e to the j pi k times this here, which is just bk. And so now we go back to the Fourier series table. And we say, ah, if I multiply, let's see here, by, let me find it here, e to the j pi k. Uh, hold on here. Let me find e to the j pi k. Let's see. Yeah, so look at this here. So we have like, if we shift in time, we get the Fourier series coefficients multiplied by e to the minus jk omega naught t naught. So can we make e to the j pi k look like e to the minus j k omega naught t naught? Well, yes. So we know that this is e to the minus j k 2 pi over 8 times t0. So then comparing these two here, we have j pi k here and minus j 2 pi k t0 over 8. So that's basically then, so we need to make pi k equal to minus pi k t0 over 4. So I canceled the 2 here. I cancel the pi, cancel the k. So then I get t0 is equal to minus 4. So if this signal here was, I don't know what to call it here, let's call it um, like Q of T. If this was Q of T, and then this signal here is R of T, this is like R of T, which is equal to Q of T minus T zero, which is four. So this is T plus four. So this is just a, a shifted time domain signal. And so this signal has Fourier series coefficients minus one to the K sine of pi K over eight over pi k for k not equal to zero. And then otherwise it has Fourier series coefficients, so we have to go back to the this formula here. A zero is two T one over T. And T one we said was what? Um, one half. So then this this is gonna be two times See, we got T1 is one half, really? Is that right? Two times one half over eight, which is equal to one over eight. For k equals zero. So this is not this is not quite right. So now we have everything correct except for the one Fourier series coefficient. So if that was the case, how could you modify that Fourier series coefficient? Well, I, I, yeah, the one half will come. Yeah, you're right. I didn't, I didn't put the one half in yet. But okay, let me let me put the one half in. So let's suppose that R of T is equal to one half of this. So then this is going to be this over two k, and then this is going to be times one half. Oh no, actually, that gives me the right answer directly. Oh, perfect. That, that simplifies the last part of my problem. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll do that in a second here. Okay, all right, so then this, so then what that says is that um, the, you know, inverse of the Fourier series, well, this is not, it's not really the right way to say it here, but let's say the reconstructed signal is going to be R of T is one half Q of T plus four. Now, um, let's write this signal here that we were calling X of T. Let's write this in the time domain here. 
So x of t is equal to, we have a, a what this is is a whole bunch of, a sum of shifted rectangle functions. So we can write this as sum from k is minus infinity to infinity. The rectangle function of, so this is going to be like t minus 8, so k times 8, because it's periodic with period 8. And then this is, now we need something to divide here to give us t1. So what do we divide by to get t1 on my rectangle? How do we scale? Rectangle normally goes to 1 half. 2t1. So 2t1 will give me t1, so then I scale this by 2t1 here. If x of t is this, then we have that q of t is equal to, was that, that was equal to the shifted, where did it go here? Yeah, let me think, okay, so q of t was just the specific function with, um, would be k from minus infinity to infinity, rectangle function of, yeah, t minus 8 k over 2 times 1 half, which would just be 1. And then R of t would therefore be equal to 1 half times the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity, the rectangle function of t plus 4 minus 8 k. And this would be our reconstructed signal here in the time domain. Now let's look at the case where we had almost exactly the same thing, but um, like the, this is that's actually the one we did in class, which was slightly different than this. So now suppose that we have the signal that has Fourier series coefficients, same as before, almost. So it's going to be minus one to the k sine of. Let me find this, pi k over 8 over pi k for k not equal to 0, and then it's equal to 1 for k equals 0. So here, so we know that our function r of t, which is 1 half the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity, rectangle function of t plus 4 minus 8k, that has Fourier series coefficients minus 1 to the k, sine of pi k over 8 over pi k, for k not equal to 0, and then 1 16th for k equals 0. So here we have these two things are exactly the same, and this is only different. So how can we get, how can we change this from this. How can we modify the signal so that it has a different Fourier series coefficient? Yeah, there's going to be linearity. I mean, um, we don't have any, if we look at the table here, I mean, you know, look at the ways that we can modify the coefficients. So we can add them here. We can phase shift one. We can kind of flip them all around. So none of these flipping ones works for us. Ah, this one here, look. Convolution in time, multiplication of frequency. But we only have to change one coefficient. So this would be overkill, the convolution. So that we have this here, which is multiplication, which is a convolution in discrete time. Ah, that doesn't work. Differentiation, that modifies all the k. So none of these here, I mean, you go through the table here, none of these can modify really only one coefficient, because they're all, they're all a function of k. So we're going to go through and use linearity here. So actually all we're going to do is what, what function has a Fourier series coefficient at k equals 0 and nothing anywhere else? Anybody know what function that is? So like suppose that suppose that z of t was was equal to 15th over 16. Well, this is a constant. So if you look at this with respect, if you pretend that, you could, pr you could pretend that this function here is periodic with period 8. Right, this looks like this here. 
this is that weird special case where you could say, well, it's periodic with any period or it's not even periodic, but really it's periodic with any period, so it's periodic with period eight. It doesn't have a fundamental period. And yeah, so, so if I take its Fourier series, right, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna integrate over this area. So what I'm gonna get is, I'm gonna get that it has Fourier series coefficients, AK equals 15 over 16 times what? Well, no, I mean, really, we're just gonna get delta of k here. I don't think there should be a t there. Let me think here. Over t. No, yeah, you're right. We need the you need the one over we need the one over t here. So, oh, sorry, I screwed that up there. Yeah. So then we need let's make this 15 halves, and then that's going to have Fourier series. 1 over t times 15 halves times delta of k, which is going to be t is 8, so that's going to be 15 over 16 times the delta of k here. And so the delta of k means that this is equal to 15 over 16 for k equals 0, and it's 0 otherwise. That's why I'm writing the delta there. But the delta shouldn't be a surprise, because remember in the Fourier Laplace, you have a constant in one domain, you get delta in the other domain. So if I had a delta here, I'd get a constant there. I mean, it's, you know, one or the other here. So therefore, if I had a new signal, let's see, what do we use? Q, R, let's call it W of T. So if I have W of T is equal to 15 halves plus R of T, then I would get the correct Fourier series coefficients here. Minus one to the K, sine of pi K over eight, over pi k, then one, assuming all the math was done correctly here. That would be like, like your final answer here. So any questions about this here? <laughs> mm, maybe I made a mistake here. Um, let me think here. So maybe divided by t. Yeah, actually, no, right. I mean, yeah, this, the t shouldn't be there. Sorry. This because when we integrate, we get rid of the t, right? Yeah, so the t should not be there. No, 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 this is right, right? Because we're going to, we have 1 over t, but then we integrate over t, so those two cancel out. Yeah, okay, sorry, so that should be 1 16th. All right, that makes more sense here. It's getting confused there. Um, yeah, okay, so now, like, what if you had to modify the Fourier series coefficient the fourth coefficient, what would you do of the A4? What if we had to change it to something else? What signal would you add? No, I just have one coefficient. No, just one coefficient. A4. A4 is different. It's something else. I, I'm going to make A, let's say I make A4 zero. So, uh, so the function has exactly these Fourier series coefficients, except a4 is zero also. All right, let me write that here. So think about that for a second here. So 11. So what if, suppose I have minus 1 to the k sine of pi k over 8 over pi k a not equal to zero, except that I have one at k equals zero, and I have now zero at k equals four. This is my new signal. <laughs> it's really devious. I got rid of one Fourier series. So using the same logic as before, right, if I go back through the table, it, all these here, these are all a function of k. So the only thing I can really do is here. So what signal can I add to get rid of the fourth Fourier series coefficient? Okay. But it was over here, right? So if I take, if I take this here, so I'm going to take this, um, so I have minus one to the fourth power, that's one. I'm going to get sine of, let's see what happens here, pi times 
4 over 8 over 5 times 4. So then let's see, we get sine of pi over 2, which is just 1 over 4 pi, right? Just 1 over 4 pi. Just 1 over 4 pi. And so then I'm just going to, this is, this is what that Fourier series coefficient was, so I'm going to subtract it to W of t. So my W of t is that function that was, uh, where did it go here? Um, yeah, there it is. Okay, so I get 15 sixteenths minus, ah, but look at this here, right? We're missing, we're missing what here? E to the j, what though? 4 times 2 pi over 8t, which is just e to the j pi t. So this is 15 sixteenths minus 1 over 4 pi e to the j pi k plus 1 half sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity rectangle function of t plus 4 minus 8k. So that's the answer here. Yeah, so you can kind of selectively pull off coefficients by adding and subtracting the different frequencies here. Oh, wait, sorry. I got the, the k here. It should be a t. It should be a t. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And you know, I mean, we could see it from here because if we multiply this something like this, times x of t, that shifts the Fourier series coefficient of the frequency domain, so x of t is a constant. That's a delta, so we shift the delta, so we get this here. So it all kind of makes sense from the table. All right, that's, so that's this kind of extended um, example here of, of doing a reconstruction. Now let me see here. Let me skip. All right, I'm going to skip the last couple here. I'm going to do some things with eigenfunctions because that's also on midterm number two. Okay, so let's go for now. This is eigenfunction examples. <coughs> okay, so first of all, we're going to do a few examples with the... Um, an ideal low-pass filter, because this is similar to what was on the homework that, that many people got stuck on. So here's a filter with this transfer function. This is H of J omega here. So this is my, this is my filter response, my frequency response. So H of J omega is equal to what? What does this look like here? Stretch out rectangle function, so rectangle of this is the, well, this is omega, omega over 200 pi. Yeah. Okay. So that's just you know that's our formula here. Okay. So now let's find. Um, Let's go through here and find the response to, so this is my system here. So I've got a system, goes into the system here, that's the impulse response, that's the output, and that impulse response, h of t is equal to the inverse Fourier transform of h of j omega, which is what, by the way? Well, All right, let's just, uh, okay, so recall we have this Fourier pair that if we have like the sink of T is rect of omega over 2 pi. So if I put, if I scale here by 
100. And then that means that the rect of omega over 2 pi times 1 over 100 is going to be, it's going to go to what here? Sink of One hundred sink of T. So that's the impulse response. Anyways, but that's actually not the point of the problem here. So what I want to do now is I want to find the response to cosine of two hundred pi T. Okay, you have um, the basic approach would be to convolve cosine of 200 pi t with the 100 sink of 100 t. We could do that. But that um, seems rather tedious. So let's think of a different approach. Well, we can always write cosine of 200 pi t as 1 half e to the j 200 pi t plus 1 half e to the minus j 200 pi t. Now we use the eigenfunction property. We use the fact that to remember that if I put in like e to the st into this system here, impulse response h of t, what I get out is h of s e to the st where h of s is actually my Laplace transform, h of t, e to the minus s t dt. Now, a special case of that is if I put in e to the j omega t into this h of t, what I get out is h of j omega, e to the j omega t, where h of j omega is the Fourier transform of h of t. So this is the eigenfunction properties <coughs> that if I put in a complex exponential, I get out a complex exponential times h of s. If I put in a complex sinusoid, I get out a complex sinusoid multiplied by h of j omega, the transfer function evaluated at that frequency. So now, let's figure out here what the output is. So the output, so if, let's say x of t is equal to the cosine of one, 200 pi t, what is the output? Does anyone see what the output is? So first of all, the output is going to be 1 half e to the j 200 pi t times h of j 200 pi plus 1 half e to the minus j 200 pi t h of minus j 200 pi. All right, so this just follows from <coughs> linearity and the fact that we broke the cosine into these two pieces here, right? So is that clear, what we just did there? <coughs> now, how do we evaluate this? What is this value, h of j of 200 pi? What's that? We have. Well, we have to plug this into the rectangle function, which seems like really tough. But look at the rectangle here. Look where its cutoff is, 100 pi. So what is it at 200 pi? It's zero. So the output is zero. Because it's outside the pass band of this ideal low pass filter. Now, for what frequency does the output become non-zero? What's the highest frequency that this filter can pass without it canceling out and going to zero? Yeah, basically 100 pi. 100 pi is the boundary. So it will pass, you know, it depends on what you assume is actually happening at 100 pi, but it'll pass 100 pi or it'll pass 99.999 pi. Right, that's basically the boundary here. 
So frequencies that are over here, they get canceled. Frequencies over here, they get passed with no gain or phase shift. Yes? Well, because remember that this right here, this J, for the most part is, here is just a notational convenience. We, we use it because here, right, this, this H of J omega is equal to H of S evaluated at S equals J omega. That's right. Yes, you don't, when you have a formula that's like, like our formula here is H of J omega equals rect of omega over 2 pi. You wouldn't plug in like J omega because the J's, J has already been plugged in. So you don't have to plug the J omega in. The only time you have to plug it in is if you have a Laplace transform. Then you've got to plug it in. Now, that was, um, you know, sort of an easy example now. I'm going to keep the same low-pass filter, but I'm going to now ask for the response of this other signal. So what is the response to this signal here? It's going to be a signal that looks sort of familiar here. It's a square, it's a rectangle here, amplitude 3, and it's periodic with period 8. But it's not exactly what we had before. So now let's suppose that this is my x of t here. <coughs> so here, the game is to write this as, so remember that any periodic signal x of t can be written as a sum of complex exponentials. That is the Fourier series. And in our case, omega naught is equal to 2 pi over 8, which is equal to pi over 4. Now, it happens that this function here looks suspiciously like the one we just spent 30 minutes playing with. So we actually don't have to do those computations again, but we know that the Fourier series coefficients have the following form here. A of k is going to be equal to, if we look back at our previous example here, Actually, I have to go back to the much earlier one here. Let's see. Yeah, it's going to be, this one is the sine of k times 2 pi over 8, in this case times 2, times 3 over pi k, which is equal to 3 sine of pi k over 2 divided by pi k. That's for k not equal to 0. And then for k equals 0, the formula was 2 t1 over t, which in this case is equal to 2 times 2 over 8. So that's equal to 1 half. So these are our Fourier series coefficients. Uh, yes, sorry, 3, 3. OK. Now, let's look at the output here. So the output should be y of t is going to be the sum from k is minus infinity to infinity, a of k, e to the j, k omega naught t. But look at this here. This is just a complex sinusoid. So this is going to be multiplied by h of j, k omega naught. I could collect these terms here. So this is the sum from minus infinity to infinity. H of j k omega naught times a k times e to the j k omega naught of t. <coughs> and then this is equal to sum from minus infinity to infinity of h. This is going to become j times omega naught is what here? It's pi over 4. So this is j k pi over 4 times a k. I'm not going to bother to substitute that in. It's messy looking. Times e to j k times pi t over 4. Okay, so, you know, we can plug in for this, you know, I could substitute in this equation here, but, I mean, it doesn't add much value. But we can get rid of the h. 
So how do we get rid of the age? We plug it in, but furthermore, we can recognize that, ah, oh, it looks very simple here. So I can write, if you want here, sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity, rectangle function of, this would be k pi over 4 over 200 pi times ak e to the j k pi t over 4. But, you know, here, uh, maybe it's not obvious, but if we look over here, we see that this function is zero for omega greater than 100 pi, and it's also zero for omega less than minus 100 pi. So for what values does this equal to zero? Well, this is going to be zero when the argument k pi over 4, and this is the 200 pi, so w but, we're, but we're looking here, remember, at this function here. So this means that k pi over 4 is going to be, should be, there's going to be 0 when this is greater than or equal to, let's say, 100 pi. Canceling that out, so that's going to be 0 when, you know, k is, well, let's just put greater there. k is greater than And then similar argument for, um, it's also zero when k pi over four is less than 100, minus 100 pi, which goes to k is less than, zero for k less than minus 400. So then we can bring this whole thing down here. We can just rewrite this as the sum from k equals minus 400 to 400, um, a of k, e to the j, k pi t over 4. I mean, you could stop here, you could plug in that other formula, but this would be fine here. And this is a little bit tricky because actually the k of 400 occurs exactly on that boundary, so you could kind of include it or not. That's, it's not a big deal. This could be from minus 399 to 399, or from minus 400 to 400, both of those are okay. So what, what have I done here kind of intuitively to this, um, to this signal? What's happened to the signal? I cut off the high frequencies and I have made a new periodic signal. It's still periodic, right? Because this is still periodic. But I have a new periodic signal that has all the high frequencies above the 400th Fourier series coefficient cut off. And so you could also think about this as being an approximation. Um, so I had a, an infinite a Fourier series with an infinite number of terms, and I decided to truncate it from minus 400 to 400. You can think about it like that. Like if you were going to plot this function, you'd have to truncate it. I mean, unless you use Mathematica. If you plot in MATLAB, you have to truncate. So you can think about this like a truncation, but of course all we did was low pass filter the signal, so it kind of makes sense that we cut the high frequency components. So that's exactly what happened here. All right, so questions on this here, this example. Okay, so uh, we could simplify it further. So by the way, just as a, uh, to kind of complete this here, I mean, what if, What if x of t is equal to the rectangle function of t over 4? What is the output? So how would you find this output here? So we're Well, is x a sum of complex exponentials? It's not, but note that. 
assuming that the Fourier transform exists, we can write this as So in this way, it does look like a whole bunch of exponentials, actually. So then, using the same logic, y of t, so this is just an infinite sum of complex exponentials now. Ah, that's great. So let's plug in this here, 2.5 pi, pi. Multiply here, so we get h of j omega, x of j omega, e to the j omega t dt. I mean, this you could write as 1 over 2 pi, integral from minus 100 pi to 100 pi, x of j omega e to the j omega t dt. And uh, it's not an easy <laughs> integral to compute. But, um, but yeah, I mean, you can, th this whole concept applies to aperiodic signals if we think about the Fourier transform. And, th and, and look at this right here, right? This is what you get. And what is this in the time domain, all this whole thing? Well, it's convolution. And there's like 2 pi times s, the 2 pi cancels. So this is, by the way, just equal to h of t convolved with x of t. So we could do that convolution, but it, it's, uh, it's kind of ugly to convolve a rect and a sync function together. I just wanted to show this because you could get some maybe simpler function for which you could compute something like this, and then it would be acceptable alternative to computing the convolution directly, or you'd have to just convolve it. It's kind of like you have to look at the function and see. So if you have a, a periodic function or a sine or a cosine, it's very easy to use the eigenfunction property. If you have an aperiodic function, you're really just doing looking at the Fourier transform and you either do the convolution or you go to the frequency domain, multiply, and do the inverse Fourier transform. Both of those are, are acceptable there. Any question on this here, this, this idea? So if, if you know, we, we wanted to find y in the frequency domain, it would have just been y of j omega is h of j omega, x of j omega. or in the time domain, do you get the convolution? Okay, so I have one more eigenfunction one to do. I guess I, I realize now, I mean, I, I tended to focus on all continuous time. Eigenfunctions, we did also work on for discrete time, but the thing is that we haven't done the Z-transform yet, and we didn't do the discrete time Fourier transform, which we're not going to do, so it, it's, I haven't spent as much time on it, but you should know the similar concept if we plug in a discrete time exponential. But let me do one more example with eigenfunctions with a um, differential equation now. So consider the linear constant coefficient differential equation described by, let's write this as d squared y of t dt squared plus 2 dy of t dt minus 3y of t is equal to x of t plus 2 dx of t dt. And then now what we want to do is we want to find the output to x of t is equal to the cosine of 200 pi t. So this is a linear constant coefficient differential equation. Sorry, this is a an LTI system with linear, described by this linear constant coefficient differential equation. So this is an LTI system described by this here to find its output. So what's the procedure for finding the output here? So I want to find, so I got to find the transfer function. And so from this, the logic we had before, this is going to be h of t is equal to one half e to the j 200 pi t h j 200 pi plus one half e to the minus j 200 pi t h minus j 200 pi. So all we need is this transfer function here h. And so it's useful to re remember we did this 
with um, when we covered this section, I think it was either lecture 11 or 12, that if you have a linear constant coefficient differential equation, then the transfer function has a simple form. And in this case, when we were write it in terms of the S domain, the transfer function is, in this case, it's 1 plus 2S divided by S squared plus 2S minus 3. And therefore, H at J omega is equal to 1 plus 2. Now we substitute in for the S, J omega. And we get J omega squared, which is going to be minus omega squared plus 2J omega minus 3. So therefore that y of t is equal to 1 half e to the j 200 pi t times 1 plus j times 2 times 200. So it's going to be 400 pi divided by, this is, see we're already got rid of the j, so that's minus 200 pi squared, so it's going to be 4. 40,000 pi squared plus j times 400 pi minus 3 plus 1 half e to the minus j 200 pi t times 1. Get the minus here, so it's going to be 1 minus j times 400 pi divided by the negative here cancels. So we still get 40,000 pi squared minus j 400 pi minus 3. And we could, you know, we could simplify it further here. Why can we simplify it further, by the way? Uh, why do we know that? Yeah, I mean, if we put something real, if we put something real in a system, the output is going to be real. And we know that this system has, you know, it's, it's a real it's described by a, a set of real coefficients, so it's a, it's a real linear constant coefficient differential equation. But, you know, look at this here. I have 1 plus j times 400. I have 1 minus j 400. I have 400 plus j 400 pi minus 3. I have 400,000 pi squared minus j 400 pi minus 3. So this is the conjugate of this, right? So all I have is this plus its complex conjugate. So you could find the amplitude and phase and rewrite this as just a cosine with a particular amplitude and a particular phase. I'm not writing it here, but it's, you would need a calculator to, to really make that problem happen. No, definitely not, because this is, um, the phase would only be zero if, if these guys here were, were real. But they're complex, so the phase would be... No, because the phase... Um, Right, this, this you can write in polar notation as r e to the j theta. And this you can write in polar notation as r e to the minus j theta. Yeah, so then r would be like square root of 1 plus 400 pi squared divided by this whole thing down there. Sorry, 400 pi squared. Actually, we should write this out. Minus 3 squared plus this here, which would be 400 pi squared because it's a complex number. And then the phase would be, what is the phase here? Um, yeah, I think it's the arctan of the top minus the bottom? Yeah arctan of this thing minus this, oh, yeah, it's going to be, it's, yeah, really messy here. And a arctangent of what is this going to be like, 400 pi over 1, yeah, minus something like this down here, which is going to be like 400 pi over 40,000 pi squared minus 3, oh, yeah, anyways, that's what it is. Not very exciting. Okay, so questions on this one here. We had that square wave.
So if we had that, then our H of J omega is from the previous slide, 1 plus 2 J omega divided by minus omega squared plus J omega minus 3. And so then you would just plug in for all these coefficients here. Uh, it's messy, but I mean, that's what you would get. So you'd substitute in, you get some from minus infinity to infinity, A of K, 1 plus 2 Let's put a j here, k omega naught divided by minus k omega naught squared plus j k omega naught minus 3 times e to the j k omega naught t. So that would be the response for any particular Fourier periodic function that has a Fourier series representation. And then if you substitute in for the square wave for the coefficients of a of k, then we would have our formula. And I mean, it's, it's messy. But that's what it is. If we put in x rectangle of t over four, well. We know that y, y of j omega will be h of j omega times x of j omega. So we argued before that the rect of t over 4 was, what was that? That was the sink of something. 4 sink of omega pi, I think. This would be then 1 plus j 2 k omega naught divided by minus k omega naught squared plus j, k, whoops, I'm missing that here. So omega, omega plus j, omega minus 3 times sink of something like this, if I did it right. I think I'm missing a factor of 2 somewhere. Let's see, 2. Yeah, it should be 2, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then you could do this in the time domain, but it's not very, not very easy. What if this, what if we use like, like the input was, say it was e to the minus 3t u of t. How would you solve this problem if you had to compute the output? If the input was e to the minus 3t u of t. Well, just um, without going through the problem, remember that this guy here, we have a formula for the impulse response of the system. If this describes an LTI system, it's at rest. So the output is computed from the convolution of the impulse response and the input. And so the impulse response will be function of terms that look like this. And so convolving it like this is that we've done a bunch of these convolutions already. So that's how you would compute the output. So what, what the point I'm trying to make here is that in some cases, the fact that it's a differential equation can let you simplify even further. In other cases, it doesn't. I mean, this, this case of the rectangle function, I mean, that's, you wouldn't normally study that in differential equations. And for many reasons. One, one being the derivative doesn't exist because it's got, <laughs> it's got a hard edge. So. There's a lot of reasons you don't play with that function. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is the main examples I have for eigenfunctions. And I thought I have, I have some time left. I have several Laplace transform examples where I can do some differential equation example. Anyone have a preference one way or the other? Neither of them is on the midterm. I would tend to do Laplace since we have been doing working on the Laplace transform. Or is everyone just going to bail in like two seconds when I start this? All right, I'll work on the Laplace transform here. Uh, and the Laplace transform, this exercise will be good because it's close enough to the Fourier transform that things are, are pretty similar. Okay, so let's look at some Laplace transform examples. 
And we're going to do some of these um, brute force, at least one, and the other ones we're going to do using the table. And so, as a reminder here, we have in the book two important tables. This you would want to keep in mind for the final. The one is the properties of the Laplace transform, which are all pretty similar, except for region of convergence. And then the other is the, the common Laplace transform pairs. And the pairs that, I mean, it, I think I'll do an, actually an example maybe with one of these down here, but most of the pairs that we commonly deal with are kind of one through nine. Okay, so supposing that um, we want to just go ahead and, and brute force this, this computation, at least, let's just do at least one, right? That's always fun. It's Friday evening and it's fun to compute Laplace transforms on a rainy Friday. Now, we could, could go over to the table and we could say, ah, this is this, you know, decaying exponential that we've seen a bunch of times, and this is a decaying exponential times a sign. So I could kind of go to this here and I could say, hey, look, there's decaying exponential times a sign, there's the decaying exponential, but we're not going to do that. We're going to compute it directly here. So the Laplace transform of a sum of two things is going to be the sum of the Laplace transforms. That's just from the integral. So let's focus on computing each piece separately here. So integral from minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus 4t, u of t, um, e to the minus st, dt, is equal to, so first we get rid of the unit step function, so that's going to be 0 to infinity, e to the minus 4t, e to the minus st, dt, which is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity, e to the minus 4 plus s t d t, and then this is minus 1 over 4 plus s, the limit as t goes to infinity, e to the minus 4 plus s t minus 1, and so when this converges, that's going to be 0, so this is equal to 1 over 4 plus s, and so then the question is, where does this converge? Well, we need this to be a decaying exponential, so we have to have, and then we also, through the arguments we made in class, we only care about the real part of s. So we need essentially that minus 4 plus the real part of s is less than 0. So that's the convergence condition, or 4 plus real part of s is greater than 0, or real part of s is greater than minus 4. So that's the region of convergence. So then this is the first piece here. And now let's look at the second one. So we get here, e to the minus 5t, sine of 5t, u of t. Mm. Could go after this directly, or we could use Euler's. Let's use Euler's function, because that's going to be very similar to what we just did. So let's write the second term, minus infinity to infinity, e to the minus 5t, sine of 5t, u of t, e to the minus st, dt. So I'm going to get rid of the unit step, and I'm going to use Euler's. So I'm going to get this as two integrals. So it's going to be 0 to infinity, e to the minus 5t, 1 over 2j, e to the minus j, 5t e to the minus st dt plus integral from 0 to infinity, so there should be minus e to the minus 5t, and it's minus because they got minus 1 over 2j, so minus 1 over 2j, e to the j, I'm going to do this for this up here, e to the j 5t, so there should be 5 minus 5t e minus st dt. Okay, so now I'm going to push this over here. So that's going to be equal to 0 to infinity. So I get this term here. I get a 1 over 2j here. And then I get e to the minus 5 plus 5j minus s t dt 
plus integral from zero to infinity, oh, sorry, minus one over two j e to the minus five minus five j minus s t dt. Now, let's go through here. So we have this here and this here. So this is equal to 1 over 2j. This is going to be 1 over minus 5 plus 5j minus s e to the minus 5 plus j times 5 minus s oops, times t evaluated at 0 to infinity minus 1 over 2j, 1 over minus 5, minus 5j, minus s, e to the minus 5, minus 5j, minus s, oops, ah, again, t evaluated at 0 to infinity here. So now, I shouldn't have written that, but anyways, we get, um, this is going to be the limit of something which should go to 0 minus 1, so we get, this is going to be minus 1 over 2j times minus 5 plus 5j minus s, and then minus the same thing here, so it's going to be plus 1 over 2j minus 5 minus 5j minus s, and then the region of convergence for this term is going to be the place where this thing here, the real part of that is negative. So it's going to be the place where the real part of minus 5 plus 5j minus s is less than 0. The real part of 5j is 0. The real part of minus 5 is minus 5. So we get minus 5 minus the real part of s less than zero, so then we get that the real part of S, so this switching, the, getting rid of the negatives makes that greater than zero, then pulling that over, greater than minus five. Let's look at the region of convergence of the second piece there. We need the real part of minus five, minus five J, minus S to be less than zero. So that's equal to minus five, minus the real part of S less than zero. Well, that's exactly what we had here. So real part of S is greater than minus five. So we have now taken the Laplace transform with two terms. One has a region of convergence of S greater than minus four. One has region of convergence S greater than minus five. Which of these is more restrictive? minus 4, yeah, so it's going to be 1 over s plus 4, and then this can be plus 1 over, let's see what this is here, uh, 2j, minus 5, minus 5j, minus s, plus minus 1 over 2j, minus 5, plus 5j, minus s, region of convergence, real part of s, greater than minus 4. Now, um, let me look over here. We're, we're left with this right here, these two things here. So, because these come in um, conjugate pair, let's see, minus 1 over 2j, yeah, these are conjugate pair here, then we can multiply together and simplify it further. So you could actually go through and I'm almost scared to do all that math here, but in theory it would actually simplify it further. Let's let's try it. S plus four. So I multiply these two, I'm gonna get plus this is gonna be two J times minus five plus five J minus S minus two J minus five plus five J minus minus s minus there. So if I did this correctly, the j's will 
disappear up here. Let's see. I guess minus j, minus 5j here, minus, minus 5j here. That's going to go away. No, it's going to stay. No, it's going to go away. Get 2j plus 5j, 2j minus 5j. That's fine because actually the j's are canceling and then I end up with s minus 2js plus 2js, which is going to cancel. Okay, all right, so it will actually work here. And then this will become minus 4, minus 5, minus 5j, minus s times minus 5 plus 5j minus s. And let's simplify that further as long as we're here. Nothing else to do. And that's going to become, so let's see, almost everything canceled except for the j terms there. So we got like 2j, 5j minus um, 2j, 5j minus. So that's going to be double that. So that's going to be, um, this is minus 10. No, sorry, this is 2j times 5j. So that's 10 minus 10. And then that's going to be minus 10, so that's going to be actually minus 20. If I did that correctly, I'm not confident I did, did the math correctly, but uh, hopefully. And then this is minus 4 times, and then we have like this number times its complex conjugate. So that's going to be 5 squared plus 5 squared. And then we've got a plus s squared. And then we're going to get... Um, minus this plus its conjugate here, so then we're going to end up with, I think this is minus 10s. I think that's actually correct. Okay, that actually looks pretty correct. I'm not sure there's a negative here, so this will kind of go all away. All right, let's check now. Let's check the result with the table to see if, if this was sort of correct or completely off. So this is a rather tedious problem here, and we could have, you know, like I said at the beginning, said, hey, I got this already in the table. So let's look at that. So from the table, we get x of s is equal to 1 over, this is e to the minus a t u of t, that was 4, so that's going to be 1 over s plus 4, all right, that's good. And then the second term is just what's here with a 5. So then from the table we get, um, so mega naught was, what was that here? Yeah, it was 5. Yeah, so that's going to be 5. So I'm going to end up with 5 over... Oh, wait, wait, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one here. Down here is what I need. So this is going to be 5 over s plus, and this was also 5. So this is going to be s plus 5 squared plus 5 squared. So with a huge, huge, huge amount of luck, this will actually be the same as what I just had. And with high probability, it's not. is going to be 5 over, and then this is s plus 5 squared, so that's going to be s squared plus um, 25 plus 10s, and then that's plus, what is that, 5 squared plus 25. 1 over s plus 4 plus 5 over s squared plus 10s plus 50 real part of s greater than minus 4. Now I'm really scared to look at this here. It's real part of s. Man. Well, it's really close. I think I did something wrong here. Let's see. And For the... Sorry, which one? Here or the previous one? Previous. Okay, let's look back over here. So I had e to the minus 5t. So then I split this up. That's there. And then the sign swap there.
the sign swap here is all okay. The only actually, the only thing wrong is this should be a plus 10s. That's the only thing that's missing, in fact. So this is, let's just check this here. Yeah, actually, that should be plus 10s. Oh, oh, it's a miracle. Wow. Any preference on one of these approaches or the other? <laughs> Table. Table is the better approach. Um, yeah, the table. If you can use the table, use the table. Which of these do you think I want to grade? Table, yes. If you don't use the table right, it's easy. It's wrong. Otherwise, I have to look very carefully and find the sign error, you know, how that's going to go. So, yeah. So, that's the table here. Let me do one last example with um, Laplace transform with one of these... Uh, Inverse Laplace transforms, and that'll be it. So three to compute the inverse Laplace transform of s plus one over s squared plus five s plus six with region of convergence minus three real part of s minus two. So the main thing here these inverse Laplace transforms, if you have something that doesn't look like this, then it should be in the table. And if it's not in the table, then something's wrong. Uh, probably the problem wasn't written correctly. Huh. Not that that would ever happen. Okay, so this right here, uh, we happen to know that this is actually equal to s plus 3 times s plus 2. Otherwise, you have to use the poor quadratic equation to find that out, but we factor it here. And then to proceed, we want to write, we know that this is a proper fraction. So we write this as A over S plus 3 plus B over S plus 2, where A is going to be equal to S plus 1 over S plus 2, S plus 2 evaluated at S equals minus 3. And B is going to be equal to S plus 1 over S plus 3, evaluated at S equals minus 2. Plugging it over here, we get minus 3 plus 1 over minus 3 plus 2, which is minus 2 over minus 1, which is equal to 2. And then this is equal to minus 2 plus 1, minus 2 plus 3, which is uh, minus... Okay, so then this is equal to 2 over s plus 3 minus 1 over s plus 2. And then given this region of convergence, now we have to look at the table, um, which went, here it is. Okay. So now we have to look at the table. So the thing is that we've got a root of minus 3 and a root of minus 2. And those appear here. So the minus 3 part, the real part, is greater than that. So we look over here to see, okay, the real part is greater than minus a, and that's a factor like this. So that's going to give us e to the minus a. So then this goes to, so we're going to get something that looks like e to the minus 3t u of t. Well, that's exactly it. And then now we have real part of s less than minus 2, and that, of course, that's going to bound this part here. So we get 1 over s plus 2 but this s is less than minus 2. So then we get something over here. Ah, oh, this is, you know, minus 2 here. This is minus e to the minus 2. So then this is going to be minus e to the minus 2t u of minus t. And that's it. Which, this 2 here? Yeah, it's right there. You just didn't see it because I was uh, I used that invisible ink, but now I revealed it. Okay, so that's it. And then the thing is here, I, I, this is the same as like the one I did in class. It's like slightly different, but you know, go through the cover-up method here and uh, to find these coefficients. So actually, I have one. I guess one minute more. I just want to to show one example here. So for which I don't think I did in class, but so what if, what if we had like 
s squared plus s plus 1 over s squared plus 5s plus 6. So this was x of s. So how would we proceed here? This is not a proper fraction. It's an improper fraction because s squared <coughs> is the same in both the numerator and the denominator. So if you had a fraction that was like, say, 7 fourths, what would you do if you wanted to get that in terms of proper fractions? Anybody remember? I think this is like second or third grade. Divide. Exactly. So to get rid of the proper fraction, this is, a, this is an improper fraction. Ah, so we have to divide out. So this is s squared plus 5s plus 6 divided into s squared plus s plus 1. And so the only thing we want to do is we want to get rid of the s squared. So all I have to do is multiply this whole thing by 1. Right, so then I subtract it. So then this is going to be equal to 1. So this is like s squared plus 5s plus 6. I'm going to subtract all of that. And that's equal to 1 minus 5, which is minus 4s. 1 minus 6 is minus 5. So therefore, x of s is equal to 1 minus 4s plus 5 over s squared plus 5s plus 6. And I took the minus and I just put it there. And then this would be written as 1 plus a over s plus 3 plus b over s plus 2. And without going through, because this up here has changed, the coefficients have changed, but basically x of t is going to be equal to, what's the inverse of Laplace transform of 1? You have constant in one domain, you have delta in the other domain. So that's delta. So then this is equal to delta of t plus a e to the minus 3t u of t minus b e to the minus 2t u of minus t. So that would be the answer here. So whenever you have an improper fraction, you're going to get terms that look like this here. I guess I'll stop there. Any other questions? Okay, that's it. You can stop the recording.